Hey everyone! Today I want to go over a series of core graphics concepts that I wish I had understood before I started learning shaders. When you write a shader, you are primarily responsible for writing a vertex function and a fragment function, and the graphics system handles the rest. But if you don't understand how the system makes use of your functions, it can be very hard to understand what's going on. Even if you don't expect to be writing a lot of shaders, this video should hopefully demystify some of the magic that converts 3D assets into 2D pixels on the screen. Let's start with the absolute basics, a triangle made up of three 3D points, or vertices. Before we can think about pixels, we need to convert these 3D points into 2D points on a virtual screen called the viewport. To do this, we need to take into consideration the position and rotation of the triangle, as well as the position and rotation of the camera. In many scenarios, we also want to factor in the camera's perspective, which means objects further from the camera appear smaller. Interestingly, all the transformations required to convert a 3D point into a 2D point in the viewport can be encoded in a single 4x4 matrix. How this is done is beyond the scope of this video, but there's an amazing tutorial by Catlight Coding on this topic that I will link in the description. In a shader, this 3D to 2D transformation is performed in the vertex function, though the system provides you with many powerful helper functions to handle most of the complicated math. We now have our triangle converted into 2D points in the viewport. From here we can start to think about what pixels we want to send to the screen. The first part of this is called rasterization. You take the 2D triangle and the pixel dimensions of the screen, and figure out which pixels the triangle covers. How this is done is again beyond the scope of this video, but it's unlikely you will have to modify this part of the system. Now that we know which pixels this triangle covers, we need to decide what color each pixel will be. This is the job of your shader's fragment function. In this simple example, we just want the triangle to appear white, so in our fragment function, we just return white. We can return whatever color we want from the fragment function, and it will be sent directly to the screen. Even by just writing a solid color to the correct pixels on the screen, we are able to create a convincing 3D illusion. Ultimately, the only difference between our single triangle and a AAA game is that a AAA game has many more triangles and much more complicated shader functions that are able to output a much more complicated arrangement of colors to create the illusion of a realistic 3D world. While we probably won't get to AAA quality in this video, we can definitely spice things up with some textures and lighting. You've probably seen a texture from a 3D game before. There's clearly some relation between the texture and the pixels that end up on your screen, but it's not clear exactly how this transformation occurs. It's surprisingly simple. First, we need to associate each vertex in our triangle with a location on the texture. This is called UV mapping. Locations on the texture are specified using the 2D coordinates U and V that go between 0 and 1. It's possible to do this by hand, but a 3D modeling program can help us visualize the mapping. But knowing which part of the texture the vertices are sitting on doesn't tell us how to color our triangle. When we rasterize a triangle and get the list of pixels it covers, we need a way to associate each pixel with a different location on the texture. To do this, we need to make use of one of the core functions in 3D graphics, interpolation. Each rasterized pixel is a certain distance from each of the triangle's vertices. Using these distances, we can combine the three vertices' UV coordinates into a new UV coordinate just for that pixel. We can then read from the texture at that coordinate and output that color to the screen. Surprisingly, this is all it takes to create a convincingly textured 3D image. All we're doing is rasterizing the triangle, interpolating the UV coordinates, and outputting those parts of the texture to the screen. The interpolation process does the right thing no matter how the triangle is positioned or rotated. Even when the triangle is angled such that it is only a few pixels wide, the interpolation system finds the right places on the texture to sample to give the illusion of foreshortening. Previously, we mentioned that the shader's vertex function is responsible for converting the 3D vertices into 2D points in the viewport. The vertex function is also responsible for telling the interpolation system what information to interpolate. Whatever data is returned from the vertex function will be interpolated for each pixel and sent to the fragment function. The fragment function receives this interpolated data and calculates what color to write to the screen. This explains the somewhat complicated relationship between the vertex and fragment functions. The vertex function runs once for each vertex in the triangle, and the fragment function runs once for each pixel that is covered by the triangle. So if the triangle is very small on the screen, the vertex function will run three times, and the fragment function will run tens of times. If the triangle is very large on the screen, the vertex function will again run three times, 
and the fragment function will run thousands of times. The piece that ties these two functions together is the extremely powerful rasterization and interpolation step that happens between the two functions. Now let's take a look at how to create the illusion that our 3D model is being lit by a light source. Lighting in 3D graphics is a huge topic, and there are many different approaches with varying levels of realism and computational complexity. For now, we'll look at one of the simplest approaches. Let's imagine we have a light source that is very far away, like the sun. And let's imagine we have a surface being lit by the light source. If the surface is facing directly at the light source, it will be maximally bright. As the surface turns away from the light source, it will get dimmer and dimmer until it is perpendicular to the light source. Anything beyond that, and the surface will receive no light and so be black. To demonstrate this, let's look at a more complicated shape. Instead of a triangle, let's look at a sphere made up of a relatively small number of triangles. The same rasterization and interpolation principles apply to each triangle in the sphere, and by linking the triangles together, we create the illusion of a solid object. In order to light this object, we need to know in what direction each surface is facing. But looking at our raw data, we don't actually have surfaces. We just have vertices. So we can only specify what direction each vertex is facing. This is a bit hard to imagine, so here is a visualization. These directions are called normals. Going back to our vertex function, in addition to sending the UV coordinates to be interpolated, we will also send the normals to be interpolated for each pixel. In the fragment function, we now receive a new interpolated normal that is an average of the normals of the three vertices based on the pixel's proximity to each of those vertices. This ends up producing a smoothing effect, which will be very useful for letting the object. The interpolated normal represents what direction each pixel is facing. This is sort of strange to think about. You would imagine that because each triangle is flat, all the pixels for that triangle would be facing the same direction. But thanks to interpolating the normals, we can fake the triangle being curved, giving each pixel its own facing direction. With this facing direction, we can now calculate the lighting. In the fragment function, we have access to the direction of the light as well as its color. We compare the direction of the light and the normal direction of the pixel using what's called a dot product. If the pixel is directly facing the light, the dot product will return 1, and the pixel will get the full intensity of the light. As the pixels start facing away from the light, the dot product gets smaller and smaller, meaning the pixels receive less and less light and get darker. When the pixel is perpendicular to the light, the dot product will be 0, and the pixel will receive no light. For pixels facing away from the light, the dot product will be less than 0, which we will treat as 0 to avoid any weird artifacts. By multiplying the light intensity by the color from the texture, we end up with a lit and textured model. Because of the interpolation step, the normals will always be smoothed out across the triangle's surface. If you want to create flat-looking triangles for a more geometric look, you actually have to do extra work to create duplicate vertices for each triangle so each vertex has the exact same normal direction. This surprised me at first because I figured making a smooth model would take more work than a geometric one, but it's actually the opposite. This cube has duplicate vertices for each side to keep the interpolated normals all facing the same direction. If we combine the duplicate vertices, we end up with something like this. The lighting on our sphere doesn't look very real, and it's mostly because we're missing things like reflections, shadows, and ambient light. Lighting is an absolutely huge topic. If you're interested in more realistic lighting, I would highly recommend Catlight Coding's tutorials on this topic. They will seriously blow your mind. They will be linked in the description. And that covers the core concepts that underlie most 3D graphics. You take a 3D mesh, flatten it into 2D, figure out which pixels each triangle covers, and determine what color each of those pixels should be using texture and lighting data. When you write a shader, you are customizing two parts of that system. In your vertex function, you perform the 3D to 2D conversion and prepare the data you want to be interpolated for each pixel. And in your fragment function, you receive the interpolated data and perform the calculations required to determine the final pixel color. Usually, the most interesting calculations take place in the fragment function, while the vertex function simply prepares the data your calculations will require. From here, I would recommend checking out the numerous shader tutorials available online. There's a lot more left to learn, but I hope this overview will give you the base knowledge required to make sense of other tutorials. If you found this video helpful, consider giving it a like. Thanks for watching.